Welcome, everyone. Uh, hopefully, we are all seeing this. I'm going to give a few minutes here for everyone to uh, join us on Facebook Live, get those announcements uh, sent out, and Facebook uh, dragging people in. Uh, for those joining us, my name is Thaddeus. I am the planetarium educator here at the Bell Museum. Our planetarium is closed right now, but we are in luck because we have a bright, beautiful, sunny day, a little chilly, but very sunny, and we have some beautiful sunspots that have come into view. So today, uh, for the next uh, 45, 50 minutes, we are gonna be doing some solar observing. Uh, I'm doing it from here at the Bell Museum, and hopefully you're doing it from the comfort of wherever you are. So let's get started. All right, uh, so today we are viewing the sun in a variety of wavelengths. In fact, the first view, what you're seeing right here is the entire spectrum of the sun, what we call full spectrum or white light. Um, imagine if you took a rainbow, all those different colors, and you collapse that rainbow together. That's what we're looking at right here. All the light from the sun, all those different colors combined into one. Now, uh, you're hopefully getting this view here, um, and you're seeing that it's not just white. This magnificent sunspot grouping that's shown up over the past few weeks is nicely visible here. Um, and we're going to zoom in a little bit, maybe a little bit more, oh, maybe even a little bit more. I right, know that's a little too close. Um, so zooming in here to what is actually near the southern, uh, near to the uh, little bit south of the equator of the sun. And so I should say this image is actually uh, flipped uh, 90 degrees. So it's tilted on its left 90 degrees. Um, but what we're looking at here, just a little south of the equator is a sunspot grouping, uh, an entire active region, in fact, uh, that was first visible about a week ago, uh, first uh, detected about uh, almost two weeks ago now. And it's an area of the sun that's about four times the size of the earth, give or take, plus or minus. Um, so these little areas here, these dark spots, each of these there, easily over the size of the earth, and when combined together, we get something even larger than our planet earth. That's just that main grouping. You can also see down here as well, there's a nice little, uh, nice, well, I guess small in this case, relative to the other area, small, sun, small sunspot grouping there. Say that three times fast, so, small sunspot spot grouping. Um, now I'm actually gonna, we are using, uh, or I say I'm here using uh, a camera, it's called the ZWO ASI 183MM, which stands for monochrome. Um, so we're looking at the sun um, using a black and white camera, and this is attached to a very special telescope, um, a telescope that has a very special solar filter for it. Um, so we are observing the sun here using a telescope, but not just an everyday telescope. This is one that's made to look at the sun. Um, in fact, what we have here we're using to uh, get this image is something called a Herschel wedge, um, which is a very cool piece of astronomical equipment um, that filters out 99.999% of the sun's light. Oh, I'm wondering if any of you just saw that flash go by. Um, I'm thinking that we might have had a plane just go by the sun, and that's what we caught there. Uh, so we're observing the sun, we're also observing what's right here on the earth as well. Um, but again, we are observing the sun again with um, some very special equipment. Um, so I, I hope that you are enjoying a sunny day. I hope this has been a, uh, starting to be a good start to your Monday. Um, but just remember that uh, don't, look at, don't look directly at the sun um, with your unaided eye because you'll go blind and that'll be bad. So don't do that. Um, this social wedge, by the way, donated to me by Mr. Roger Kennedy. Roger, I hope you're out there watching this. Um, I'm glad now that we finally have a chance to put this, uh, this white light uh, scope to good use here. Um, right now, it's been so exciting to see the sunspot um, and to see some activity on the sun overall because we are near, or actually we're just leaving uh, solar minimum. So every 11 years, the sun goes through a cycle of going from a minimum of sunspots to a peak. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've been down near that minimum. The sun's been very quiet. We haven't seen a lot of sunspots, really seen any activity. Um, but now we get it. Um, now we're starting to see more sunspots appear as the sun starts to become more active. Uh, the sunspot cycle is fairly regular. Um, every 11 years, we've been counting for going on almost 300 years now. Um, but there are some higher peaks and some lower uh, dips when it comes to activity. Um, so the last sunspot cycle, 20, or well, we're in, entering sunspot, sunspot cycle 25. The last couple sunspot cycles, 23 especially, they're pretty quiet overall. Um, but this has been a great start so far. These active regions have come into view, um, but we've also detected more of them using some of our different telescopes. We've detected ones 
Um, in fact, we can just still see it here. I wasn't sure we're gonna be able to. Um, we've detected ones that have been uh, coming around the edge of the sun. Um, so coming just into view and ones that are also leaving our view as well. Um, so we can see a little sunspot there just over the limb, over the edge of the sun. Uh, I believe that is the leading edge. I believe that's the one moving away from us. Um, hopefully I've got leading and trailing edges correct there. Now, the exact cause of the sunspot cycle is not really known. Uh, we, we, are, we know what happens. we are uh, got great observations of that over hundreds of years. Um, the exact mechanism is not entirely known. We do know why these sunspots, though, why the sunspots themselves, so what's going on there. Um, when we look at the sun, we have a massive, huge magnetic field. Um, all just one large one, as well as smaller, more localized magnetic fields. Now, all of these different magnetic fields, as they go around the sun, or as the sun rotates, um, all these magnetic fields, uh, they can get twisted and turned. Um, and I'm actually going to try to find an image that I have of this, not from, uh, not from my telescope, uh, but one from one of our telescopes in space. Um, because I, I realize magnetic fields, you know, we're probably used to magnets, but we're maybe not entirely used to thinking about especially very large magnetic fields. All right. So we're going to see if we can get this image up here. And I know I have a compatriot there in the background. Um, I'm wondering if my compatriot there has had any questions that have come up on Facebook. I'm not able to get to that right now. I haven't seen any questions as of yet, Tad, but I will definitely jump in if, if any pop up. Awesome, thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna change my screen for just a second here. Jump to this image that shows uh, a magnetic field, some of the magnetic field structure of the sun. Um, and oh, Amber, in the background there, can you tell me what you're seeing? Are you seeing our sun? Yes, I am with magnetic field lines. Okay, awesome. Thank you. My uh, my Zoom controls just disappeared, so that's exciting. All right, but that's okay. So this is an image uh, from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, SDO, um, and it's an image uh, taken, uh, in fact, a few months ago. So this is not um, the most current sun right now. Um, they don't do uh, magnetographs for all of all of the solar images, um, but we can see the dates uh, down there at the bottom. Um, but there was a, a small sun and grouping that will help us today. So we can see the sun again has this very large magnetic field visualized by all these white lines here. So we have a North Pole, we have a South Pole, which is just convention up and down, um, and all these field lines wrapping out. So there's one big one, but you can also see if looking all over, especially I'll zoom in a bit down here, we can see there are more localized magnetic fields. There are areas of the sun, just smaller groupings, you know, that are only 10, 20 times the size of the Earth. These areas have their own magnetic fields. And in fact, we can see a small active region right here. So we can see where some field lines are connecting. So this happens again, as the sun spins, as it rotates, it takes about 25 days to rotate at the equator. Um, as it rotates around this large structure, it gets warped and distended because different parts of the sun actually rotate at different speeds. It gets a little slower as you go towards the North and South Pole. So this differential rotation, this different rotation speeds, this is, causes the magnetic fields to get twisted up. And as they get twisted up, as these magnetic fields get twisted up, they start to cut off energy that's flowing up from underneath, from uh, underneath the surface of the sun. Um, and that magnetic field structure cutting off that energy coming from underneath, that causes sunspots. It causes what are actually cooler spots on the sun. So when we see a sunspot like we do, um, like we do right back, where my sunspot got to, right back here, we're seeing this magnetic field activity cooling down the sun. Now, when I say cool, uh, don't get me wrong, it's still the sun. So along with being giant, the sun is incredibly hot. In fact, what we're seeing right here, this white light view, this full spectrum view of the sun, this is actually looking at the surface of the sun. So we're looking at the lowest layer that we can look out of, or look at as we look at it from here on Earth. Um, and this layer right here is about 10,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Now those sunspots are a little bit cooler, they're only about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So yes, still very hot. 
And when I say surface, I don't mean any sort of solid surface. I don't mean like rock, like here on earth, something we would stand on. The sun is made of an electrified gas, a plasma. And this is like a uh, great description I've heard for it is like very, it's like a sort of like a fondue pot of cheese. So very, you can imagine as, as gases that are moving and flowing around, um, but not really a gas, not a solid, not really liquid, but plasma, a different state of matter. Um, for those who haven't had fondue in about a year, um, well, think about it in a few months when we, when we get back to it. Um, hey, Ted. Yeah. So I do have our first question from Tim. Tim is not wondering if we will notice any effects on Earth from these particular sunspots. Great, great question. Will we notice any effects? Uh, we actually already have, not from this uh, particular sunspot, um, but we have noticed in the past few weeks um, with some of the other sunspot groupings we've had, we have seen some really intense flares and coronal mass ejections. Um, so I'm actually gonna change my share here and grab another photo from SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, over the last few weeks, and this is the active region we're looking at here in the white light view, this is looking at what's called H alpha. Um, over here on the other side is another area that actually just flared. We have seen some flares occur and these flares, these have been big bursts of energy. Um, they're kind of like a short circuit on the sun. They're where magnetic field lines touch, they, and they interact, they snap, and they release a burst of energy. Uh, kind of like when you, if you rub your feet on a, a carpet um, and then you know, touch someone, um, which again, you're not supposed to really do right now, so give it a few months for that. Um, that's kind of what's happening on the sun, that little spark. Um, now that's happened and we have noticed um, them hitting our earth. Um, we've noticed that the atmosphere has gotten a little bit more electrically charged. Um, this hasn't directly affected, um, say, our, our everyday lives, um, unless, and especially if you're a ham operator. So if there are any ham operators out there watching, or if you know any, you should probably, um, well, if they're watching, you already know this, but if you, if you know any, you should, you should call them up, uh, get on your own Zoom call with them, and see if they've noticed any effects. Because when these flares do hit our atmosphere, when the atmosphere gets more electrically charged, when it gets ionized, we can bounce radio signals off the atmosphere further distances. So ham operators using radio waves talk uh, different distances. Um, before, if they were here in Minneapolis, maybe they were able to talk all the way down to New Mexico. But when the atmosphere gets ionized, they might be able to talk all the way down to uh, Chile, down to the equator, even further around the earth. Um, so that's some of the effects we've seen uh, just lately, um, some increased electroactivity. Um, I've seen just Anecdotally, so this isn't data per se, but I've definitely seen on some Aurora uh, face groups, uh, Facebook groups that I follow, I've definitely seen um, some more photos coming out of the Aurora. Um, some of these are previous days, so they aren't, they're, they're images that, that have taken time to get, uh, to, to have gotten. But I've also seen some more, up, a little uptick in activity. Um, and that'll probably be the biggest effect that we see um, if we have clear skies, of course, fingers crossed. Um, when these flares happen, when the atmosphere gets energized, we usually get um, a little bit more intense aurora, which is uh, always really beautiful to see if you do get the chance to see it. Um, now this view here, again, that we're seeing, this is from one of our satellites, it's called SDO, Solar Dynamics Observatory. And this is a satellite in space. Um, so it has a couple advantages um, from us here on earth. Uh, first of all, it doesn't ever have to deal with clouds, which is super nice. Um, it also has a very amazingly fantastic camera and some very, very amazing filters. So this view we're looking at here, um, actually, I want to correct myself. This is not actually H alpha. Um, SDO looks at us, uh, at helium being energized in the atmosphere of the sun. Um, but this is looking at even more intense areas. So where before the surface is about 10,000 degrees, here we're looking up into 50,000 degrees. So we're looking even hotter, even more energetic. The plasma is really moving around. This is where we can track things, where we can see the effect of those active regions on the surface. So I'm going to jump back to that sunspot there just so we can get our bearings. And I'll zoom out a little bit here, um, try to match our view. I'll also make sure I can, I'm just gonna adjust uh, the telescope here. Uh, the great thing about um, our setup right here is I'm actually doing this all from inside. The telescopes are actually about 200 feet away from me um, and almost hands off, although I've got a great compatriot out there, Sarah, who I hope is also gonna give me a hand in just a moment. 
All right, but we can see this active region of the sun um, down here with the sunspots. Um, and I keep pointing to it, and I know you can't see that. Hopefully you can point to it yourself. Um, that active region of the sun is on the surface that we're seeing right here. Um, but this is mirrored when we look further up, when we look into the atmosphere of the sun. Over here is the same active region. And it's actually looking a little almost more like that, just to match views here. Um, so this is that same active region, but now we see this intense activity up in the atmosphere of the sun. So everything that we track on the surface, it's, it's at first glance, I, I, and I, I say this as someone who's been doing this for years, I even I remember seeing it for the first time, like, that's just kind of white and there's black spots, like, all right, whatever, that's, that's cool, it's the sun, but you know, all right. But we have to look at the surface. It may seem boring, but it's actually incredibly exciting because the surface there of the sun, that determines all this other activity, what we're gonna get, what's gonna happen in the atmosphere of the sun and, and what could potentially affect us here on the earth. So in fact, one of these flares that happened is actually visible. The remnants of it is actually visible down here. Uh, I'll move it so we can see a little better. On was the left side of the sun. This is the side of the sun that's actually coming around towards us. So we can already detect that there's an incredibly active region there. Um, some really interesting activity is already going on. In fact, um, just a few days ago, uh, going to, See if I can grab another image here. Um, just a few days ago, we actually saw a really amazing uh, flare and potentially coronal mass ejection happen. And the other great, 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 great thing about all this uh, data from SDO, all of data from NASA, this is all visible uh, or all available uh, to you. So actually what I'll do here is I will um, share my Chrome screen um, so that we can actually see where I'm getting all this from. So you can see it yourself. Um, you don't just have to sit here and listen to me talk. Um, so we are looking here. And Amber, I'm going to ask you again just to double check that we are seeing my Chrome screen. Is that correct? Yes, we are indeed seeing that. Um, and, and our next question actually comes yeah. from Mary, if you want to hear Mary's question. Yeah, um, I'd love to. Mary's wondering if there are sunspot seasons like you would have with the hurricane season. Are there sunspot seasons like we have with the hurricane season? That's a that's a good question. I would and I would I would answer yes, but on a on a longer eleven year cycle. So not every year, but every eleven years, um, starting um, from what we call solar minimum, where we have almost no sunspots, all the way to solar maximum, um, where we have a ton of sunspots. Um, that's the real sunspot. That's the sunspot cycle. Um, is similar in many ways, though, as you're thinking about it, um, that is kind of like we have hurricane season. We know that every year on Earth with some predictability, we're going to get this more intense time um, where we're going to get more hurricanes forming. Um, you know, well, I'm thinking here in America, so I was thinking down in the Gulf, but of course across the world. Um, that would be the longer cycle on the sun. This sunspot cycle isn't it isn't totally understood why that happens. Um, there's a lot of questions we have about the sun um, that we're just starting to be able to answer. Um, but we know the sunspot cycle happens with, with great regularity. Um, we've been tracking it. We're in solar cycle 25 right now, um, but we've been tracking this for um, going back. Well, you know what? I'm just gonna do a little bit of math. Uh, 275 years. Um, and, and again, you can see this data yourself. Um, we've come here to the SDO website, uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. This is their data, I should say. This is their homepage um, showing where in fact uh, SDO is. Um, right now it's talking to White Sands. Uh, it looks like it's talking to White Sands, one of our radio telescopes there, maybe to uh, one, of, one of our radio receivers. Um, and the SDO website has a ton of information. Um, what I always look for, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things going on. I just look for that more images button down here where we can see a view, but I look for that more images button because um, that takes me to this page where I can see using the different filters that SDO has, I can see the latest imagery from the sun. So when we look at the sun, um, we're always ending up looking, um, generally to get a lot of detail, we end up looking at different elements. In particular though, SDO has been designed to filter light coming mostly from iron. So iron, we think of it as a metal, right? Just this thing, everyday sort of thing, iron. I've got a cast iron pan, absolutely love it. But if you heat iron up to a million degrees, it's not a metal. It becomes, it turns into a gas, um, it 
turns into plasma, and it puts off different colors of light. And at different temperatures, that iron will give off very different colors of light. So iron is not just this punk of black metal that you might see on your stove. Um, it can glow all sorts of different colors when you heat it up again to millions of degrees. Now, we generally don't do this at home. In fact, I would recommend not heating a cast iron pan up to a million degrees. Um, bad things will happen. Um, but if you look at the sun, that's what you get right here. Um, all of these different colors are different states of iron. Um, and there is so much to talk about. I, 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 I'm not going to spend all my time on SDL because I've got a different view that I would hope to get to here. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, show, I'll bring out one view here. Um, this is, um, and Amber, can you tell me, we're seeing a giant view of the sun there. I don't know if Zoom caught up to that. We are still seeing um, the the mag the magnetic field lines image. Oh, okay. Um, oh, now I see the image you were describing. All right, so we're seeing the sunspots again. Um, so this is a view from space. Oh, and it looks like I had my view backwards. Um, this is a view from space um, using the SDO telescope, and this is where we can see. Oops. Sorry, one second. I'm trying to do something with a different screen here. Um, this is where we can see that same sunspot, sunspot grouping. Um, we can also see that one that's coming around the leading edge there. Um, we can, if we go back to that view here very quickly, it's again looking at the surface. Um, we've seen that red light view, um, but I'm gonna grab something, one of my favorites, just cause it's pretty. Um, I'm gonna grab our view of uh, one of the states of iron. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head of the state of iron this is. Um, but it's glowing in green. So not, not what you might think of as the sun, but what is still part of the sun's light. Um, when we'll come back to our white light view in a minute here, um, but when we look at the sun, when we think of the sun generally, when we think of all that light, that light is made up of different parts, different colors. Um, so it's made up of the entire rainbow. And again, by looking here at this view in this beautiful green color, um, we're seeing again that active region. That's where the sunspot activity is on the surface. Um, but now we're looking higher up in the atmosphere and we're seeing how incredibly intense that area is. We're seeing the shape and structure of magnetic fields. Um, so that's these different lines here. Ooh, zoom way in here. Um, and it's just, it's incredible. And now we're really starting to see some really big, big, big structure. In fact, um, if we come over to this area here, this is an area that's now rotating into view for us. Um, so we're just starting to see it directly from here on the earth or above the earth or SDO. Um, but now we're looking at areas that are getting to be, I'm, gu I'm guesstimating this one is easily over five times the size of the earth. I mean, it's starting to look like even 10 times the size of the earth. This is a big, big structure. And the activity that's being output by this, all of this magnetic field activity, it's drawing up material into the atmosphere of the sun. It's causing these giant prominences. This area is now arching out dozens, hundreds, can't get up to hundreds of times the diameter of the earth. Huge, massive structures. Um, at, and I should say hundreds of times as this material starts to leave the sun. Now, someone had asked earlier, again, what sort of effects are we seeing or are we seeing any at all? This is why we keep, a, keep an eye on these very high energy areas because all this material will start to, or it can start to, especially if there's a flare, an eruption, it can start shooting off the surface or off the atmosphere of the sun. Luckily, this area is facing away from us, um, but that can, um, that can um, there is a slim chance that that can cause more than, than things I've talked about before, like, like aurora or just allowing ham radio operators to talk across longer distances. Um, we do know that these high intensity flares can cause major problems with things like our electrical grid. In fact, in 1989, there was a massive solar flare along with a coronal mass ejection where part of the sun actually detached from it, um, part of that plasma came off the sun. And back in 89, that hit up in Northeastern America and Canada. That actually burned out a large part of the Canadian power grid. Um, and it caused uh, transformers to burn out across the East Coast there, um, down, reaching down as well into, North America, into the uh, United States. Um, now, we, that, and that's why we track these things. And nowadays we do have a great eye on the sun with SDO. Um, it's able to watch in all these different wavelengths um, and it gives us this information to stay informed about what's going on. Now, I actually wanna bring up our, 
Did I hear something back there? Ever? Yeah, we we actually have our first question uh, from a young person, and it's a big one. Um, oh. Bennett is one. And Bennett is wondering why sunspots are important. And I think you've started to answer that in terms of how they may affect us here on earth. But are there, from a student perspective, are there any other reasons why sun, studying sunspots is important? Oh, well, boy, let's see. All right, how much time do I have? All right, um, all right, so, why, boy, I can't get the S's out today, I've gotta to say, um, studying sunspots. Studying sunspots, I would say is important um, first of all, because it is easy to do. Um, now, I always give a lot of warnings about the sun, don't get me wrong. Um, looking at the sun is a dangerous activity, um, so you wanna make sure you have very specially designed solar equipment to do that, like we are doing here. Um, but with some different methods, especially like a projection method, you can see this view of the sun yourself. Now, one way to do this actually, to project the sun safely, is to use a pair of binoculars. Um, these binoculars, so just regular binoculars. Now, don't, don't put your eyes up to the binoculars, just hold them. And hold them up against a piece of white paper or if you have a, a flat wall. And, that, and, then, and then, don't look through the sun, still don't look through the binoculars though. Um, and then by aiming the binoculars at the sun against the wall, not looking through them, um, you can project an image of the sun on a wall or a piece of paper or whatever you have, a poster board, um, whatever you've got. Um, this is actually, this is probably something a lot of people have done, um, maybe without realizing exactly what you're doing, but the classic, uh, using magnifying glass to light things on fire, um, hopefully just, you know, wood and bits of grass. Um, that's what I did as a kid. Uh, that's actually projecting an image of the sun, but it's, it's focusing image of the sun. Um, with binoculars, you get to project that image and you can get a really nice image. And so you can see these sunspots yourself. You can see them one day. You can, in fact, using, especially if you've got a piece of paper, you can draw where they are. And then you can come back in an hour or probably better the next day, whenever it's clear. You can, hopefully there'll be sunspots still there, and you can draw them again. And if you do this, if you keep track every day, um, every few days, whenever it's sunny, if you keep track of them, if you're drawing where these sunspots are, you can see something really, really amazing. Something that I've already just sort of said along the way, which you might not have realized, um, the sun rotates, it spins. So it is not just this circle there, like we see on a screen, it's, uh, it's not just there in space, a circle, it's not, it is in fact a ball, a sphere, it is round like the earth, um, but that round sphere is spinning. So it's moving. This is a small thing these days. We, well, maybe, maybe it's not. Uh, it, it, um, do we, we know the earth moves, that's a pretty everyday common thing, but maybe we haven't realized the sun spins. And this is especially big news as we start researching into the sun, as we just, as we personally, as, as people, as scientists, as we start learning about it, whatever age student we are. Um, and it's incredibly important going back hundreds of years to, to people like Galileo. Galileo was one of the first people that we have records of that drew these uh, sunspots in great detail. He's one of the first people that we have records of that noticed, that really realized that the, the sun itself was spinning, that it had these blemishes, as he called it on it, these smears. Um, and so in fact, as you do this experiment yourself, as you project the sun safely, um, as you make your own records and recordings, you're following in the footsteps of great astronomers from the past. And as we go towards solar maximum, uh, you know, give it about six years or so, um, as we start seeing more and more sunspots, what we'll start seeing is that the sun rotates, but in different at different speeds. So as we look here, we're tilted on our side, um, but going up and down is the equator. So uh, east or west and east, got that right. Um, and then north is over here to our left and south is over here. Um, I'm gonna try to actually draw that. So this should be, all right, maybe my, all right, Zoom isn't letting me annotate it, but I hope you got it there. Le to your left is north, to your right is south, up is west, down is east. I think I've got that right. Um, but as we get lots and lots of sunspots, as you start drawing them, you'll see that around the equator, sunspots are moving really quickly. Uh, the sun, you'll actually notice um, a rotation speed, not to give things away, I want you, I do want you to discover this yourself. 
So in fact, you know what, I will give you an answer and I hope you can discover it yourself and come back and tell me whether or not I got it right. You'll notice that the equator, the sun is actually rotating in about 25 days. But as we move towards the pole, so the south and north pole, we see that this rotation of the sun slows down. It gets down to about only about 30 days. So it's still pretty fast overall, this giant thing, a hundred times the size of the earth, a million times the mass of the earth, it's rotating around in 25 to 30 days, depending on where you are. Um, but that's, to go back to this original question, I know, really, I did ask how much time I have. Um, that's why sunspots are so cool. They give us some insight into these basic dynamics of the sun. Um, things that have taken hundreds of years, thousands of years to, to study, and things that have still left a lot of questions for us. Um, looking at the sun, um, because it is dangerous to do, um, it, it's something that has been, uh, well, very hard for everyday people to do um, because we can't, we don't always have this equipment very easily accessible. Um, what we do have nowadays, though, um, is equipment that's been getting better and better um, for amateur astronomers um, and more and more accessible. So that, in fact, brings me to another view, a completely different view. Again, Amber, I'll double check with you that we are seeing this. Oops. Um, are we seeing a pink sun? Yes, we are now seeing a pink sun. Um, Excellent. And if you're ready, I have one more question that came in from Kathy. I would love one. Yeah, Kathy, Kathy's re she's referencing what you were talking about that it happened um, in the late 80s um, and is wondering if we get hit with another big CME, will our power grid shut down safely, unlike what happened in 1989? And more importantly, will our cell phones still work? <laughs> okay, um, well, I hope our cell phones still work um, and I hope the internet still works because there are a ton of cat videos out there that I have not seen. On a more serious note, um, will our power grid shut down? Will we keep our cell phones? Will we sort of keep our modern lives? That's a big question. And I can't give you an exact answer. Um, I can't give you an exact answer because the power grid, especially the American power grid, it is widely distributed, which is actually overall a good thing, um, more generally speaking. Um, but it is, it is controlled by different groups around the country, um, and they don't always just sort of, because everyone's very busy, they don't always talk to each other and share information. They don't always upgrade at the same rate. They don't always put in the same, they don't always put in the same equipment. Um, and that leads to slightly different power grids all over the country. Um, and that means that with a massive, if we had, say, some giant, what we call a Carrington event, named after um, the scientist, uh, named after an event that happened a couple hundred years ago, a Carrington event. Um, and that's the name of a scientist who made recordings of this. If we had this event where a giant massive flare, a coronal mass ejection, part of the plasma of the sun detaching off it, hitting the earth, if that happened, our power grid could become overloaded and it could shut down. There might not be a way to distribute the load across the entire continent, just because we have these different power grids that aren't always tied, tied completely together. That could happen. And if that happened, yes, cell phones would probably also go out. That being said, all that doom and gloom being said, um, I realize it's appropriate for 2020 here. Um, this is something that we are more and more aware of. This is something that we know about. And so this is something that power grid operators, scientists, engineers, politicians even, they are working together to make sure that this doesn't happen. We know that our power grid is essentially part of our national security. It's part of our national defense. Without a power grid, we really don't have all this stuff we love. Um, and so people are working together to make sure that it does stay safe. Um, and that's why groups like NASA, this basic raw, this what we call you know, basic data, um, this basic science being done, why this is so important. Um, because it's not just studying the sun because it's cool. I mean, it is studying the sun in part because it's cool to look at. Um, and it's a, an amazing thing to study but it's studying it because it has such an important effect on our lives. Um, and that's why uh, SDO, it's been up there for uh, going on a decade now, um, why it's been joined by other observatories, um, Solar Observer by NASA and the European Space Agency, the Parker Solar Probe, um, which is just an amazing, amazing telescope. It's um, flying through the outer atmosphere. Parker Solar Probe is 
probe is flying through the outer atmosphere of the sun, um, what NASA is calling it's touching the sun's atmosphere. Um, it's getting closer to the sun than we've ever been. Um, and it's helping reveal more answers about, um, about some, of the, some of the different parts of the sun, in particular why the corona, the very outer atmosphere, is so much hotter than the, um, than the surface. So, um, boy, I'm just giving those super long answers, Amber. Um, but I suppose it might have given more time for another question, or I can explain what we're seeing here. Why don't you go ahead and, and start with an explanation of what you're seeing? Sure. All right. Um, so this is coming, again, from a different telescope, uh, or not again, I haven't said it before. This is coming from a different telescope with a different camera. And this is a type of telescope that has become much more accessible to amateur astronomers um, in the past couple decades. Um, it's something called an H-alpha telescope, or hydrogen alpha. So before, if you were here when I was looking uh, and sharing the SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory um, information page or the data page, Solar Dynamics Observatory looks at different states of iron being ionized in the sun's atmosphere, iron being heated up and giving off light. Now, that's some very specialized equipment, but the most common color of light that we've ever looked at with the sun is hydrogen alpha. This is where the, sun, the hydrogen atom gets heated up to just a few tens of thousands of degrees, and the electrons around the nucleus, they move around. Particular for you chemists and physicists out there, you might already know this, but this is where the uh, electron around in the hydrogen atom and the nucleus, where it drops from three to two. And uh, if I got that wrong, I'm sure the physicists and chemists out there will correct me. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's where it drops from three to two and it gives off light. In particular, it gives off a very specific color of light at 656 nanometers, um, what is in the red and what we call H alpha. Um, so this view of the sun is looking in the atmosphere of the sun at, um, ooh, very bright, um, at tens of thousands of degrees. And it's where we can see that same structure we saw on the surface, um, where we can see those sunspots. Let's zoom in a little bit there. Um, it's a little fuzzy. Um, Sarah, if you're watching, please feel free to play with the focus at all. Oh, I think you heard me because that's perfect. Um, it'll, it'll come back. Um, my colleague, Sarah, our planetary and programs coordinator, came in to help me out. Um, she's actually now out on the deck because it turns out as nice as uh, equipment as we've got, um, you still need a human somewhere. In the group. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we can see these sunspot groupings on the surface. Uh, or excuse me, now in the atmosphere, their effect, their cooling effect is still extending upwards, although it is um, not quite as great. Um, and it is coming in and out of view a little bit here. Um, but this is also where, when we look around the edge of the sun, we can see um, different activity. And I'm gonna try to maybe try to draw some of that activity out. Um, this is, might not work too well. I was trying to do this a little bit earlier and I wasn't having great luck with it. Um, And so Sarah, actually, if you're listening, um, there's on the H alpha scope, that uh, pressure tuner on the side, um, that gold um, that gold pressure tuner, if you wanna turn that inwards, um, that might help me out here. Um, I will actually check and see if Sarah is texting me right now because that's, as someone mentioned there earlier, um, our, our cell phones are incredible. They are an essential part of our lives. And they are a great way to stay in touch. Look at that now. Um, all right. Um, so what we can capture here in H alpha though, what we're trying to bring out, and again, we may or may not be lucky here. We'll see how it goes. What we're trying to bring out is prominences and maybe even that flare region, but in particular prominences. These are areas of the sun's atmosphere where the magnetic field activity is so strong that these magnetic fields are actually drawing out material from the sun. So the plasma is being drawn along these magnetic fields. Um, if you were here a little bit earlier, if you're watching a little bit earlier, we actually, um, we were seeing that from some of the SDO data from space, but now we're trying to capture right here from here on earth. Um, and these prominences are, well, first of all, they're simply amazing to look at. Um, prominences are these giant loops of plasma that are extending out hundreds of, um, hundreds of thousands of miles, there are multiple diameter, Earth diameters out from the sun. And seeing them is just an incredible experience. Not to oversell it, of course, because it's not coming in here. I do realize that. Um, 
But they're also really great because they do show us where all that, activ all that activity is happening on the surface, below the surface. And in fact, looking at prominences along the edge of the sun is one of the ways that we can detect what's happening on the parts of the sun that we can't look directly at. Um, right now, we do have the Solar Dynamics Observatory Telescope that is looking at the sun. Um, and we have another telescope called Stereo A, which is ahead of us and looking at the side of the sun that's, that's rotating out of our field of view. Um, but we don't currently have a telescope in space that is looking at the far side of the sun, the side of the sun that we can't directly see from here on Earth. We used to have one, it was called Stereo B for um, behind. Um, unfortunately, Stereo B um, suffered a failure um, several years ago and is not operational, which was a great loss to, um, to people studying the sun here on Earth, I can, I can tell you that much. Um, but we don't currently have a way to study that far side very easily. Um, what we can do, though, is we can look at this prominence, this, this, this activity that happens on the sun, and we can tell from where there are prominences on the edge of the sun, we can tell that there's some activity happening below on the surface. And again, this all feeds back into this idea that we've gotten a couple of questions out here. How does the sun affect us here on Earth? And in ways of like flares and coronal mass ejection, ways that it can affect our power grid or cell phones, we need to keep track of what's happening there. And those prominences of activity there, just that gives us an, another cool way to study that effect. All right, I'm gonna hazard a guess and say that, um, that I, uh, that I, I'm not gonna be able to bring in our prominences today. It's something I'm gonna work on for next time, though I can assure you because I don't wanna just tell you how beautiful they are. I do want you to all see how beautiful they are. And in fact, I think I can do that um, using, let's see if I can grab an image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory again. Um, there we go. So this is actually an image from, uh, we can see 1129, so just yesterday. Um, we can see the active area of the sun that's facing us, and we can see all along the edge of the sun, all this activity. So not quite what we would still get here on Earth, but what I was hoping to bring into view in particular, though, over here. I want to just let this image sink in for a minute. I want to grab a little bit of water. What we're looking at here is one on the left edge here is one of these prominences. Well, not just one. We're looking at thousands of loops of prominences arching out from the sun, massive magnetic fields, and evidence of one of this incredibly active region that's rotating into view around towards us. This is an area that did have a flare just a few days ago. It was an M-class flare. It's one of the highest, one of the highest flare levels we can get with thousands, uh, if we're gonna put, we can just say volts, it doesn't really, there's no good comparison for it. Uh, millions of volts of electricity arching, arcing out from the sun. Um, this is uh, something that's gonna be very exciting to watch in the next few weeks here. Again, the sun takes about 25 days to rotate at the equator. That means that we've got a lot of time for this area to come into view um, and a lot of time to, for, to view it from here on earth. So we're gonna get a good solid, like say two weeks of viewing here of this as we, as we go into the future and if the skies stay clear, no promises. Um, but again, this is data is all available to you. It's from the SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory. I, if you've been watching this entire time, first of all, thank you. Um, second of all, you know I, I've been saying SDO so much talking about it um, because it is some, it's just such a cool spacecraft. We put a spacecraft in into space. We put, a tel we put different cameras on it. We put different filters. And we've been able to study the sun with it, which is just so exciting. Um, now, uh, we can see this isn't the only area, of course. Um, back on this uh, far side, the side moving away from us, we can see there's that small active region that, that's moving away. Um, we can see just along the edges, general field activity. So just a nice little prominence arching over here, the sun, uh, arching above the surface of the sun. Um, the sun is, is incredibly dynamic, um, hence Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, it is constantly changing. Um, you can spend weeks studying just one active region, but if you focus on just that one region, you're gonna miss all the other things that might be happening elsewhere, um, especially in these different wavelengths of light. Um, in fact, looking very closely here at this SDO image, this is just this is zooming way into the atmosphere. Um, looking at all these bright spots and these dark spots, what we're seeing here are areas 
where the sun is, is convecting, where it's get, plasma is rising upwards and then it's falling downwards. So just the, just the atmosphere of the sun, especially the surface, it's constantly uh, boiling, kind of like a boiling pot of water. It's constantly moving around. Um, and that level of detail is something we've only been able to see in the last decade. Um, and something that's been getting better and in a sense easier to see um, with the newer telescopes that are going up or being built as well. Um, especially one of our, our latest solar telescopes in, uh, I believe it's in Hawaii. All right, uh, Amber, I know I'm reaching towards the end of our schedule time. I'll, I'll check one last time if there are any of our last minute questions. I don't see any questions, although we did have um, a ham, op, ham radio operator write in and, and just make yeah. a comment. And great seeing solar cycle 25 get going so abruptly. Propagation yeah. has been great for the past few weeks, hoping it lasts as we head further towards maximum. Um, and our audience has also jumped on board and provided several links for um, weekly space weather videos and also a, a British series that was, um, it looks like on PBS called Cobra, talking about the possible side effects of solar flares here on Earth. So we, we thank our audience for jumping in with those additional resources. Very nice. Yeah. And I, and I know I was, I hope I wasn't a little too, I hope I wasn't too melodramatic there with the power grid failing and everything. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's very unlikely to happen. Um, for example, we just had that massive solar flare from that active region, that, that area that's moving in, that it's moving in, into view towards us, but the, the flare that just happened was pointed like 90 degrees away from us. It was just way off, way off into space. Um, so for these massive flares to really affect us, for things like CMEs to really affect us, it does need to be perf pitch perfect timing. It needs to be right at us, um, or even actually not really at us. It's got to be right um, sort of before us because it's moving, the sun is rotating, so that material gets moved around. The earth is spinning, the earth is also moving around the sun, so everything's in motion there. So things really have to line up perfectly. Um, so we've seen actually overall in the last you know, few decades, 100 years, We've seen a lot of flares and large flares happen, but none of them, well, except for 89 in particular, um, but very few of them have had any really big impact on the earth just because, well, again, everything's got to line up really, really well. Um, we've come back to this view of our, um, maybe our white light sun. Um, I am trying to get some things out of view there. Um, we come back to this view of our white light of our sun. Um, and I guess I'll wrap up again, just a quick overview of some of the equipment we use. This is all very special equipment used to look at the sun. Um, so for example, what we're looking at here um, is uh, using a very special solar filter to look at the sun, something called a, a Herschel wedge, um, donated by Mr. Roger Kennedy, if you're still watching. Thanks again, Roger. Um, had this solar wedge for going on four years now um, and it uh, hasn't been put to a lot of use because the surface of the sun that we're seeing has not been super exciting. As that ham operator said, it has been great that the solar cycle has started with just a, a boom. Um, that previous view that we're seeing, uh, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll jump back to it as well. Um, um, this other view of the sun, this is coming um, from, again, a very special piece of equipment. Um, it's called an H-alpha telescope. Um, this H-alpha telescope um, is designed to just look at the sun. That's all it does. It just looks at this one particular wavelength of light coming from the sun, this hydrogen alpha light. Um, and so it's a pure solar telescope. Um, it's something that sort of always gives really great views. Um, uh, and attach this actually to get this as well. That's a very specialized piece of equipment. Um, but actually what this image that you're seeing, uh, this is actually coming from a Canon T6. Um, so this is coming from a pretty common camera, an everyday camera, DSLR. Um, so to actually image the sun like this is, is really, in a sense, not to overstate it, it's really simple these days. Um, you just need a very, a rather special piece of, of observing equipment itself, the telescope itself. That's the real key. Um, so but Ted, again, yes. it looks like we're actually not seeing the image that you're describing. Do you maybe oh. want to try and try it once again? I would love to. I think, yep. How has that? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, so uh, hopefully you all remembered everything I said. Canon's coming from a Canon T6, H off a telescope, very specialized telescope, um, but a pretty everyday camera. Um, and to be honest here, also very average uh, astrophotography skills. Not gonna overstate my astrophotography skills here. Um, 
But if you do want more simpler ways to look at the sun, um, you can uh, project the sun. Um, you can use something like a pair of binoculars um, to project the sun against a piece of paper or a wall. Being very careful not to look, don't look through, don't look through binoculars at the sun. Don't look at the sun directly with your unaided eye because you will burn out your eyes and that'll be super bad. Please don't do that. Um, but you can project it in different ways. That's actually how we've gotten our first drawings of the sun from Galileo projected images. Um, and this is something that um, especially, and this is great. The great thing about the sun too, it's so bright. You don't need really expensive binoculars. In fact, a, a cheap pair of binoculars is fine for this um, because it's just gonna be pointed at the sun there and you're not gonna be looking through them. Um, so you can sort of use any piece, any sort of binoculars you have lying around to do it. Um, you can draw that image you see there. If you do have a telescope, if you can get in better and better views, um, uh, again, a solar telescope with a camera, you can start to get views like this as well. All right, now, I've just been trying to bring into view um, something here of the sun. We'll see if I get anything here in our last minute. Um, the software I'm using here incidentally is called DigiCam Control, D-I-G-I -I Cam Control. It's a free piece of software. It's actually been a great, great help over the past uh, eight months or so um, in, in setting up our astrophotography uh, here at the Bell Museum. And the image here is moving, just so we're aware. It's not, the, tele the Earth is not shaking, uh, at least right now here. Um, this is, I'm actually controlling our telescope from inside. I'm moving it around a little bit um, to try to try to get a center of view here. And this may be just something we have to save for next time to really bring into view. Um, the prominences are very faint. So that's why I'm actually uh, really giving a longer shutter speed here. Um, so we're going to a 15th of a second. That's uh, pretty, well, for the sun, this is very slow. Um, because the sun is so bright. And I'm just sort of zooming in. I'm looking to see if we have any regions. And I want to do that right there. Um, any regions that we can draw out. So we're seeing a very bright view of the sun here. And the problem is because they'd be so faint, they'd be sort of looping off the edge here. One problem, of course, is that there's sort of a very fine balance. You're trying to capture something very faint right next to something that's very, very bright. Um, so it's also possible here that I'm just overwhelming our view. So I'll drop our aperture down and we'll see what we can get. So you know, drop our shutter speed down. And we'll go very low. What I'm using as a reference point here is we have that sunspot. So I actually may be looking in the wrong orientation. I might've been doing that wrong. That's very possible. See what's a, let's see what's going on in this part of the sun over here. See if we draw anything out. Um, there are astrographers who spend just all their time just studying the sun. Um, it is uh, a very exciting and fun thing to do. Um, it's a little bit, it's just like everything in, in space, it's a completely different skill set. Um, just because you've imaged globular clusters uh, or planetary nebulas doesn't mean you can easily just hop over to imaging the sun. Um, and as someone who's just started doing astrophotography, um, it's, it's just always exciting learning just what exactly I need to change to get a better view. All right. But Amber, you know, I might think, I think I might have to call on this, um, spend a little bit more time getting better at, at imaging this um, for the next time we share our live view of the sun. So I'm gonna stop my share there, come back to just me. Um, Happy holidays, by the way, everyone, if you're seeing my background there. Um, and as we reach sort of the end of our scheduled time, at least, um, uh, well, Amber, any last minute questions? No, I have not seen any questions roll in. Excellent. Well, I hope that everyone has uh, gotten a, has enjoyed seeing our sun here. Um, it is, especially it is, it is sunny out and we can see it, which is always beautiful. We've got some nice sunspot groupings there that we've been, that we've been seeing as well. Um, that's the view I'll leave with because I because I can't not share the sun here. Um, and I hope you've all enjoyed learning a little bit more about the sun. I hope you've learned some ways to see it safely yourself, um, whether 
digitally through the computer screen at SDO, or if you've got some astro equipment lying around, some binoculars that you can safely project a view of the sun, you can do that as well. Um, my colleague, Sarah, who's been helping us out, first of all, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you as well, Amber. Um, but my colleague, Sarah, is also going to be sharing directions in a few weeks on how to make a solar, uh, solar camera to track where the sun is across the sky throughout the entire year. So if you really wanna keep a long track of the sun and how it changes just where it is in our, just where it is in our sky, uh, please keep an eye on our Facebook page where, we, where Sarah will be sharing those instructions again in the next few weeks. All right, um, I'd also like to thank all of the people who've donated equipment. Um, Roger, I mentioned you a few times, third and final shout out, thank you again, Roger. Um, but we've also had some donors who have donated the telescopes that, that I've been using today. Um, I, I don't have their, uh, they prefer to keep their names anonymous, which is good. That's totally of course, okay. Um, but I, I do wanna, if you're watching this, a huge thank you for donating this H alpha telescope, as well as that Astrotech 102 millimeter. Um, they're fantastic telescopes and they've allowed us to do so much more um, with our astrophotography program. So thank you so much for donating those. All right, um, I think Amber, we're gonna wrap it up with that. Um, thank you, thank you so much for helping out behind the scenes. Um, and to everyone out there watching, I hope you stay safe, uh, stay warm, <laughs> it's a little chilly out, um, and have a great, great week.